Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Some of you and peace out to the rest of you. Hit the share button because the message is more important than the messenger. Um, you can see the title and I'm going to go ahead and tie all of this together, of course, but I'm going to do it in such a way that when I say this next sentence, some of you will understand the rest of the message before you even hear it. When you tell the truth, you tell the truth for the right reasons. Or you might as well fuck the shuck up. Now, this is important. Of course, I'm saying this for a reason. When you tell the truth, you tell the truth for truthful reasons. You tell the truth for honest reasons. You you do the right thing and for the right reasons. You say the right things, but also for the right reasons. This is really what that's about. And as Muslims, we've been told to, st to speak a straightforward word. In other words, to be honest. And we're not required to just talk for the sake of talking and wasting words. We're not required to do any of that. So we can easily um, just fuck the shuck up, not say nothing if we don't think we can say something that is constructive and helpful to other people. I'm going to tell you now that Omar Johnson has said some things that are true. And these are valid points. I myself, when I first became Muslim, was very much like Omar Johnson right before I became Muslim. I believed in blackly black, this, that, and the other, and to a certain extent, I still do. I don't believe that it is wrong for black people to focus on black people's issues because we're forced to do this, even when we're Muslim, because frankly, even Muslims that aren't black are not always capable of understanding, and if they are, they don't want to understand. And likewise, I'm not capable of understanding certain things that they uh, oftentimes tout that they oftentimes inform us. And I mean, I cannot grasp it. I can't understand, just like um, many people will say, well, I don't understand how so many, uh, uh, so many black students will have all these excuses never ending, they never stop, there's always an excuse. And I would think to myself, well, you know, maybe you're in a public school and that probably is the case because I worked in the public school setting and oh my God, there was always an excuse. That's all the hell there ever was, really, excuses, excuses, excuses. And was, there were times when staff members would make excuses for the students. Well, before you give her that grade, Mr. Black, you need to know that she got high blood pressure. You see how big she is. I didn't tell her to eat all that. I didn't tell her to sit at home in front of, uh, on the couch in front of the TV. I didn't tell her to do none of that stuff. If she had asked me, I would have told her, get your country behind up and go walking. And in the summertime, go swim somewhere. Sitting around eating all them doggone potato chips and 12 sandwiches at one time, looking at TV, just getting big as a house. And it won't tell me that I need to understand. What I need to understand? You hungry? You gonna always be hungry. Of course you hungry. What a capital H. Four O's in the middle and six E's at the end. Hungry. An exclamation mark after that. But you know, when I'm dealing with the, uh, I mean, when I was, I ain't going front, man. When I was studying the Morehouse, I heard very few excuses. I heard them, but I didn't hear too many excuses. A lot of them revolved around new technology. A lot of them say, listen, I can get it tomorrow. My printer is out. Well, you going to get some ink? And I had professors say there's nothing to discuss. If you don't have it now, it is too late. Why did you wait until last night to decide you're going to print this thing out and it's due today? I told y'all about it a week ago so that we wouldn't have this conversation right now. And here we are with this conversation. Professors still didn't tolerate that. A lot of students said, OK, all right. You know what? That's fair. They don't want to hear that mess. They didn't when I was coming up, and I don't think they want to now. 
and quiet as it's kept, as much as Morehouse is associated with booty banditry, a lot of dudes at Morehouse didn't even want to hear excuses about why somebody was a booty bandit. They'd be like, man, if somebody did something to you and it bothers you and gives you nightmares, it makes sense you would go and, you know, get some help, some therapy, something like that, because you didn't commit that crime. But you're not going to turn around here and sashay and twitch all over uh, and then turn around and act like it's from Africa. Because some of them were trying to do that stuff. They were trying to Africanize booty banded business. And telling truths about certain things that happen in some African societies, but for false reasons. They had mentioned parts of Africa we don't even come from. Look, <clears throat> what Omar Johnson is now saying about he don't accept Islam no more because of the Arabs is exactly what I told you all to be leery of somebody doing and saying before. And I'm going to address bro both sides in here. I'm going to talk to um, the Muslims that ain't black and don't really care much about black issues. And I'm going to talk to as well um, the black and black nationalists who want to sit up and say that Islam ain't black enough for us and ain't never been black enough for us and that it's just another branch of white supremacy um, called Arab supremacy and, you know, <clears throat> crazy stuff like that that's actually not true because it ain't. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk to all of us about this. And ain't nobody going to really be happy at the end of the day with all I'm going to tell them because, frankly, uh, nobody's being flattered. Nobody's going to hear me say, you know what, you're right and the other side's just playing flat out wrong. And that's the end of it. Across the board, 100%. And you're not going to hear me say this because, frankly, I'm aware of what it is that gave credibility to what... Omar Johnson uh, said. He didn't make it up. He exaggerated, but he didn't make it up. Uh, it's not really, if you really want to know the truth, a lot of Omar Johnson's frustration doesn't come from the Muslims that ain't black, and a lot of it does. See, Muslims that ain't black have this notion that if we are black, those of us who are black are going to sit up here and, and, and imitate them, that we're going to, in a sense, become racially neutered or castrated, that, that we're going to become colorblind. They're not going to, because, you know, God forbid they have a black grandbaby. But, uh, you know, we're supposed to be colorblind so that we don't address the racial injustices that will, uh, that were performed against us and our ancestors. So I'm not supposed to have an issue with um, the white American South because of what they did to my grandfather. I'm supposed to be colorblind. That colorblindness is for me. It's not for the white uh, Southerners that drove my grandfather out of where he busted his behind to establish himself. I'm not supposed to have anything against them because they were about to lynch my grandfather because he protected my grandmother and told law enforcement or told a law enforcement employee of that particular town to stop flirting with her. And that if he stopped, then my granddad wasn't going to do to him what he would have done to my granddad if my granddad flirted with his white wife. That's how my granddad framed it. Yeah, you leave alone, I'm not going to do to you what you would do to me if I flirted with your wife, which I don't do. That's pretty much saying, I'm not going to kill you if you leave her alone. You would kill me if I flirted with your wife. And I'm telling you, I'm not going to kill you if you leave my wife alone. And the funny thing is that, of course, they were going to lynch my granddad. My grandma had to tell him, look, I can't raise these babies alone. You can't be doing this. You got to leave now and we're going to have to start over elsewhere. But I ain't supposed to have nothing against them white folk that was going to lynch him. Most of us got stories like this. My grandfather went on to do some pretty good things. And I'm not saying it's just to boast and brag. I'm saying it's to say that in spite of what he had to face, he went on to do a good bit. And there, there's, there's something 
pretty important that it's named after him. And I'm not saying his name for the sake of privacy of not only myself, but more so the privacy of my family. But there's something named after him. When he went on and, and started over in another town, in another part of the South, where my dad and my aunt were raised, where they grew up, where they call home to this day, or their hometown, he went on and he did a lot for a local community. But the thing is, I'm supposed to be, you know, colorblind because I'm Muslim now which is really another way of saying you ain't supposed to care nothing about what they did because that's in the past. So Omar Johnson is sick and tired of these notions. He's tired of one, the non-blacks who sit up here and, and act like we're just supposed to be all colorblind now. We should love white folks as if that's what Islam is really about, us loving white folks. And he's also sick and tired of black folks who follow them with that BS. And what do they do? They start turning around and using non-English names for things that have names in English when that's the language that we grew up with. And what they do is they turn around and uh, uh, so now all of a sudden they can't even say yes or no anymore. Call them by their name, they turn around, nah, So you start if you if you're an Arabic speaker and you start talking to them in Arabic, uh, they just keep on saying now nah, I and mean, they don't know what you're saying, but they don't want to tell you I don't speak Arabic. I don't know what you're saying. I got on my daughter about that one time. I grabbed my daughter. Um, we were joking around. We were playing, and I uh, I grabbed a foot. I was gonna tickle her foot, and she said to me in Arabic, "No, no, 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 enough, enough." Told me in Arabic, my daughter don't speak Arabic. I mean, like I said, I, I, I know enough full side to get around and, and take directions and have conversations. But my daughter was just I mean, she's never been to any Arabic speaking country. She's never been outside the U.S. So when she started with that, I said, well, what the F? I was like, hold up. Are you learning Arabic or something? Because to say that in the sense of panic in which she said it, not real panic, but just not having much time to think, you know, that, that reflexive reaction with which you lapsed into Arabic. I said, wait a minute, are you learning Arabic or something? Because that shows that you're thinking in Arabic. And she said, no, I don't have an Arabic class this year. And I told her later on, listen, we ain't Arabs. We learn languages and that's fine. But we ain't Arabs and we don't imitate them for nothing. Do you think that a single Arab that did not grow up in a Hausa speaking environment is going to say in Hausa, no, no, enough out of reflex because they realize they're about to get their foot tickled? Do you think that they would do that? Now, you have some that grow up in Nigeria and, and Hausa is what they, they, they grow up with Hausa. So that becomes their language and they never learn Arabic anyway. They're there because they grew up with that. Yeah, but do you think that a single Arab who did not grow up in a Hausa speaking environment is going to lapse into Hausa? She said, no, how could they? they don't they don't grow up in that environment? And I said, yeah, exactly. And she rolled her eyes at me. But she'll eventually see it. She'll see it at some point. And I told her, look, uh, you won't find out. There's going to come a time when you find out. Because a lot of them, they could be standing on the correct religion, but they still don't have it in them to actually care about the solutions to our issues. Omar is right about that. Shadid Muhammad was right about that. Now, the difference is that Omar's like, I, I don't want to stop drinking. I don't want to keep praying. I don't want to really exercise these levels of self-discipline as evidenced by me having two children out of wedlock, even though I take accountability for that. I, I don't really want that level of responsibility coming from somebody else or that level of accountability coming from someone else. No one else can tell me nothing. I ain't going to listen to nobody if they ain't black tell me a damn thing. 
Now, I don't agree with Omar's decision to leave. What I do understand is that Omar is reacting to something, and I'm not going to let the Muslim community that ain't black off the hook for that to which he is reacting. It took him years to finally say, I'm leaving Islam. Now, he had said things that amounted to, to as much for a long time. He done talked about going and being judged by the ancestors instead of being judged by God. I knew this day was coming. I shouldn't say I knew, but I, I predicted that this day would come. I expected that this day was going to come, but make no bones about it. Sajid Lipham, I don't blame you for not being OK with Omar's decision to leave. But I want you to understand that he is reacting to something. And the Muslim community is not really a Muslim community until the day that we address that to which he was reacting. Non-black people, even Muslims, hardly fiver guck about what black folks face. We have been concerned about what we and other people face. And it has not been reciprocated. <sighs> When it has been reciprocated, like in 2020, after George Floyd, we were not told about that. I knew about the protests going on in Syria. In Syria, they were protesting George Floyd's uh, murder. Even in Egypt, ironically, Egypt, where they don't care nothing about black folks. You want to see some insensitive father muckers on African soil? Egypt. Of course, they're like that with each other, too. I mean, they don't really... They don't really like anybody. They troll everyone just for fun. Mean as hell. Arrogant. <laughs> but boy, look, I'm going to tell you this. When I saw them doing that, I was really thrown for a loop. But Syria, Syria is in the, in the middle of a war now. And they were protesting like, what are y'all doing? I said, oh, wow. I knew about it, but y'all didn't hear about that. It took me a while to hear about it. My wife had to tell me what some folks were saying. You had one Somali guy in an English speaking country somewhere talking about Wallahi, Billahi, Talai. I mean, he 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 was staunchly colorblind to the point I didn't want to hear this boy say Allah's name no more. Talking about I'd rather when I'm performing with do and I wipe my hand over my sock. That means more to me than Black Lives Matter. I was like, you know what, dude? there we go saying something that could have been considered right but for the wrong reason what you're really saying is i don't see color i don't see race yes you do you absolutely do that's the kind of guy that would love to marry someone that ain't black he already sees him as being more muslim than himself even though his people been muslim since before they were in india or pakistan or many parts of the arab world even though that's the case oh yeah the horn of africa is where you got some of the first Muslim communities that were not persecuted by others. People don't understand that. You have some buildings, some uh, massage that were built in Eastern Africa and they're in ruins now only because the Qibla, the direction of prayer, is the old one. That's how long they've been Muslim. See, in Africa, the leadership could accept Islam because they weren't that arrogant. That's what happened in Ethiopia. That's what happened in West Africa. There was no conquest necessary. And so Omar's wrong when he follows these wrong historical narratives that black Africans got conquered by some Arabs and forced into Islam, which was not physically possible at that time. They could not have done it. The North may be so, but by that time, many people would have argued it. Today's black nationalists would have argued that the North back then was not black enough. By the time the Arabs swept through, they would have already argued that. When they, you know, to, if we saw them as they were back then during today's time, many of us would say, well, you know, they weren't black, black. They weren't West African with wide nose, big lips, four C hair, and that's it. We wouldn't, many of us would have said stuff like that. I would have been able to look at them and see black blood in them. And many of our people would have been able to see the same thing, but would have still said, yeah, but that's an admixture. They ain't black. Just like they would say about me if they saw me now.
Omar Ungawa Johnson is not right. But what I want us who are Muslim to understand is that he is reacting to something. And it is not fair that you decide to police his reaction at all and you ain't said a mother cuss word thing about that to which he is reacting. Even if his reaction's wrong. You just, you, you're always looking at one side of the coin. We black folk need to tone it down. No, the F we don't. We don't need to tone down a mother cuss word thing. You need to become conscious. You need to become aware. You need to stop playing around with this BS. You are lying, sometimes outright lying about certain things that have happened. You got Europeans lying on you about your role and what you've done in Africa when you haven't done it. But you're now behaving exactly the way that they told us that you did behave a long time ago, over a millennia and some centuries ago. Yeah, and sisters weren't acting like that back then, but nowadays, today, you're willing to act that way. Like you just, you walk into Africa and just because you ain't black, you're on top of everything. That's how many of you do feel. And then you go into black communities in the Americas and when they're Muslim and you want to do the same thing. And there are enough of them that will tolerate that. So nowadays, if you go into black America and uh, uh, decided you're going to try to prop yourself up as some sort of sheikh or imam or alam over some black folks that are Muslim, you'll have to find the communities that are black that will let you do that. But you'll find them. You'll have to look for them, though, whereas previously you would not have really had to look. We got stuff we got to sort out. We, we cannot have a family situation because even those of us in the Muslim community that can understand the racial problems like Shadid Muhammad still can't understand the blue pill games played uh, on the basis of gender still can't understand that African-American women who become Muslim or who are born Muslim are playing these same games as the ones that are not. And they will not quit and they will not stop. And they will come in and do everything a Muslim woman is supposed to do, except speak a straightforward word and stop playing these damn games on men. So even they have a limit to their understanding. Now, Omar Johnson, maybe he wishes that he could run up in some um, non-white, non-black exotic woman from the Muslim world. Maybe that's what he wants in, um, in his innermost fantasies. Maybe not. I don't know. But the fact that the truth is that whether it's sexually or not, these other communities have not had solidarity with black folks. And he's not going to ignore that because when it comes down to it, those communities, when they go into Europe or when they go into the United States or Canada, they will eventually become absorbed. They will go into Africa and they will live separately from Africans within Africa for five generations. Very little intermarriage. And if so, it's going to be the men that marry the local women, but not the reverse. And not because the local men ain't Muslim either. That's not why. It'll be that way in many parts of Africa in which they might settle. But when they go into Europe and North America and Australia, eventually it gets to a point where their women are marrying the local men. Oh, that's fine. So they will lose their religion and their distinction and everything. They will lose all of that when they're surrounded by white folk, but they won't lose it or even welcome in the local population to their distinctions when they're surrounded by black folk. He has looked and he has seen that these groups 
will do any and everything to not on average become a darker population of people. That if you strip everything else away, that always pops up. Grandmom don't want no black grandbabies. Which has been the case and been the, the issue in both our families and theirs over there. And almost tired of it. That's a legitimate gripe of his. For all of his conning, scamming, not being serious. And a lot of it is just black annoyer, really. But for all of that, for which we do have every right to get on him, and I would do it. This is something that he rightly observed and he overreacted. And that's where he's wrong. But I don't already got on his case enough about this. I don't already said what he needs to hear. What about what y'all need to hear? We got biases in the Muslim community. And when we black folks are biased against you, it's still your fault because you started it. And not only did you start it, you started it in imitation of the worst oppressors on the planet that turned, that did the same things to you that they did to us, except not nearly as, as bad and not nearly as long. And it was still too bad for you all. And Sri Lanka, how many of you all got Portuguese last names in Sri Lanka and y'all ain't Portuguese? Who did that to you? You going to blame the black North Africans that do exist for that? No, it was the Portuguese. You ain't got no smoke for them. But Angola had fire for them and kicked them out eventually. And they still got the brainwashing effects. That's the problem with y'all. Why are many of you even going to Europe and going to North America and going to Australia in the first further mucking place? White supremacy. You're going to these places that colonized your former countries or colonized your parents' countries. That's why your parents oftentimes went there or you're, you're the parent that went. You went to these places, even though you knew they weren't Muslim lands. And even though you knew that you had a high risk of losing your kid because they were going to put certain laws into effect. And now you can't teach your kids to stand on business when it comes to the religion. You're not allowed to teach them that in France and in Germany because they some of the nastiest white folk out there. And we were sitting up telling you how they are. We black Americans and many black Africans. Who knew about this stuff were trying to tell you about their pathology, but you had the same pathology. You just didn't want it aimed at you. And so you picked up your bags and touted that visa to these lands. And yes, mashallah, alhamdulillah, I got this visa to go live in France or the UK or Germany or one of these former colonizers. And you went there and you married, you, whether you married a woman from your own people or you married a woman from the local people who wasn't going to respect your butt no way. Didn't matter. It turned out the same with your kids. Your kids either were shut out and therefore made prone to what you would call radicalization. I think another term needs to be set up for it, but they were either shut out of everything until their, their lives literally had no purpose until someone comes along and says, hey, why don't you go back to um, someplace similar to where your parents came from and fight the colonizers there? Not knowing that that was a setup and a trap in and of itself. Or they were offered the option of integration and success as long as they dropped their religious convictions, your religious convictions. Somewhere down the line, having a compromise and you walk him right the F into that. And what was the reason that you even made these migrations in the first mother cuss word place? Because your country's opportunities were drained by the same colonizers to whose land you wanted to migrate if you could. That was white supremacy. That's why they chose to do this to your lands, to your countries. And you got the nerve to sit up and tell us we care about racism too much. We talk about racism too much. We need to just grow up and just uh, get over it. Meanwhile, you were willing to make decisions that were going to cost you and your children their identity. Culturally and religiously. And the funny thing is, when it came to the culture, you were willing to hold on to the most un-Islamic parts of your culture more than the Islamic parts. Why are you smoking? I'm asking Arabs, why are you Arab men such heavy smokers? You don't smoke because you saw black Africans on TV doing it. You smoke because you saw those old movies with white folks doing it. 
If it had been nothing but black folks smoking on TV, you would have considered tobacco to be about as bad as weed. And got the nerve to sit up here and want to tell us what we need to get over and just deal with and be patient with. And you think we can't see that kind of duplicity and then you want to turn around. And tell us. As a matter of fact, you know what, for you to tell us anything at all at this point is hypocritical. Ain't nothing for you to tell us. You think we can't see the duplicity, which means you must think we're stupid. And then you want to turn around and tell us that we're wrong because we get upset about the duplicity when the fact remains that no, no, you're just duplicitous. You're just a white supremacist. And white supremacy can't be a part of Islam. Black supremacy is only a reaction oftentimes when you, when you even find such a phenomena, which Omar Johnson did espouse at one point. I mean, verbally speaking, and he even said, I don't even want to rule over white folk. I just want us to be in a better position because we don't want responsibility for white folk and what they do. So even then, he wasn't talking about subjugating them. I would. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm sitting up and I'm saying to you, you need to be trying to put the French in chains and in bondage. That's what I'm saying. That's real. And some of you all, the funny thing is that it's some of you that are not black that are sitting up and saying, well, you know, Omar Johnson is sitting up and saying this stuff wearing white men's clothes and speaking the English language. I, and he doesn't see a problem with that. Um, an actuality that's already been addressed by those nationalist circles from which he comes even if he's not been loyal to what they really initially were upon. Because you see, there was a time when many of these black nationalists would have sat up and claimed Arabic as this language for us to speak and to learn, an ancient African language. If we were acting like we walk around speaking Arabic, an ancient Kemet. That's how many of us were at one point. We have said stuff like this, and now you're turning around and trying to use the rhetoric of the black nationalists from which Omar came against him because he called y'all out. And by the way, the fact is he grew up in an English speaking environment. He has to speak English first. That has to be the language that he knows, unfortunately. He would lament that if you would ask him about it. He, he knows what you're saying. So that's not his inconsistency. Now, there are inconsistencies, and he's addressed them himself. But you're not going to be able to take the heat off of yourselves and sit up here and try to gloss over the fact that this is an overreaction from him. But the fact is that you provoked this overreaction with your very assumption of white normality and black pathology. Hamza Yusuf was it one of the nails in his coffin that provoked this? Many of you called him out for that stuff. Asim al-Hakim sat up and said, all lives matter. And he doesn't even live in the West. He speaks perfect English, but he doesn't live in the West. But he said that stuff back in 2016. And I chewed them both out about that. In 2016, I was living in Arar in Saudi Arabia with the Bedouins. And they had the same mindset. White is normal. Black needs to tone it down a little bit. It needs to be understanding of why people are afraid of them and Bedouins who thought that the police brutality against us was inhumane because it was, but also still had this notion that we, you know, y'all aren't innocent. And if you wouldn't be so damn loud, I'm like, you know what? Why don't y'all fuck the shuck up? Cause y'all loud and you smoke everywhere you go. You take a cigarette, put the cigarette out when the Adhan sounds, salah, salah. Man, they just called the Adon. We got 20 minutes. Go wash your mouth out. Brush your teeth. Get that cigarette stank funk off of you before you tell us to go and pray. And you smoke in a closed room with your kids. Asshole. And y'all got the nerve to say something about him. Man, your cultures suck. And I said cultures with an S. It's a plural. We know ours does. We reforming it. Some of you might even sit up and say, well, Jed Black, why aren't you talking more to the Muslims and less to the black manosphere? Because the black manosphere is actually having a cultural revolution that is righteous. You're not. You should be. We have the perfect framework for it, but you're not necessarily doing that. 
Shadid Muhammad is right about that when he talks about y'all. You are letting your culture ruin your religion. And acting like you somebody normal. You all right. You ain't nothing wrong with you. Probably should have started this one without the peace greeting. Yeah. Omar is a, he might as well be a crab-eyed or cross-eyed or cock-eyed maniac with some of the stuff that this man says. He might as well be. But all of this, that whole phenomena of which he's just one part and one repetition in the pattern is because you will not only ignore our issues and maybe you can't solve them and that's OK, but you will tell us to ignore them, too. And that is not OK. That's damn near criminal. We're facing this. You don't tell Palestinians to ignore their problems. And you shouldn't. And some of you would say, well, you can talk all that black nationalism all you want, but when the U.S. Army rolls into the Muslim lands, they've got a lot of black soldiers. Yeah, I know. They've got a lot of Native American soldiers, too, disproportionate to their po uh, population. There's a Comanche brigade in the U.S. Army that was involved in Iraq. If there were more Comanches alive, they would have had a bigger battalion. A brigade or whatever the division is named. Every time a people get conquered, they wind, and they submit, they wind up helping the conqueror go and conquer somebody else. That's not right. Well, I agree with that. I don't want black folks participating in that. The issue here is that it would not have happened if many of you had not abandoned West Africa and, and much of the Sahel region of Africa, period, east to the west, centuries ago. If your ancestors hadn't done that, we wouldn't have had these conversations. Because when Europeans set up along the coast and told coastal non-Muslims go into the interior and raid, this is one of the things that wound up being the case. Many of the Muslims were living in the interior. And they were being disproportionately kidnapped. Then they began to participate sometimes and other times they didn't. The Muslim parts of Africa became divided by the slave trade. But the thing was that when, see, when some of these rulers and chiefs were writing to uh, the northern parts of Africa, like uh, uh, the, the Sultanate of Morocco at that time, and some in Egypt asking for some reinforcements, they were ignored. And some people in Morocco itself were busy going into the south in small numbers so that malaria didn't wipe them out grabbing people that were free and Muslim and transporting them to the north, just like white folks would have done across the Atlantic. The rest of the Muslim world ignored this part. Some parts of it, right outside the tropics, made incursions to grab free Muslims and put them in bondage too, and, and, and led to this acceptance of an otherwise Christian notion that black people had been designed for slavery. Omar's reacting. Say one more goddamn thing about him and ignore that to which he is reacting again. I double dog dare you. Because I call your faith itself into question. I sit up and ask if you are Muslim at all, if you entertain these uh, racist notions, even if they're subconsciously racist and you didn't realize that they were. If you were entertain a notion about race, you would not tolerate somebody else entertaining about you. I call into faith. I mean, I call into question your faith itself. Are you even Muslim? Because as far as I'm concerned, if you are, if you say you're Muslim, but you normalize whiteness and pathologize blackness, you might as well be a Satan worshiper. You might as well run around telling us that, that Satan is Lord. You might, it, to me, it's the same thing. Because you're going to serve the same purpose. Who the hell else do you think wants you to hate the most original variation of your own species? And can make you forget that he hates you for coming from it. And you're going to serve his purposes and not even think about it. We've already told Omar what he needs to know. We've already done that. It's time for you now all now to go back to your own people and tell them what the F is wrong with y'all. So that there will be no more provocations of that kind of reaction from him or anyone else like him.
Because truth be told, he's not the only, he's not the first, and he ain't going to be the last one to at one point be Muslim but black and then decide to leave it so that they can go into an African faith uh, uh, spiritual tradition just to push you away. Because you wouldn't push away the white supremacist colonizer who forced him to speak English and others to speak Spanish and others to speak French and others to speak Portuguese. And forced you to learn the same languages. Yeah. Fit the guck out of my face with that show bit. Thank you all for listening. Those of you who have, as always. Black heart, black mind, black out. Aslam alaikum and black. Heterosexual non-select male power because they don't like in a black patriarchy. Black patriarchy until extinction of judgment day. Thanks for jetting again. Well, thanks for traveling with us again here on Jet Black Airways with a phrase, Jet Black is also a verb. Keep jetting black with us until the wings and the wheels fall off. Gender and racial justice forever.